<clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Um, well, morning, everyone. Thanks for dialing in. Uh, so my name is Steve Connor. I'm the Development and Sustainability Manager uh, here at APUC. Uh, for those that don't know, APUC are the Procurement uh, Centre of Expertise for the Universities and Colleges in Scotland. Uh, and together with Kate Murray from the procurement team at Edinburgh Napier University, we co convene the Sustainable Procurement Topic Support Network at EUC Scotland. Uh, this group has been set up to share knowledge and best practice for procuring sustainably uh, in higher and further education. Uh, <clears throat> so, the, the webinar this morning really um, stems from us wanting to look more closely at the relationship between procurement and the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And so, we're very lucky to have Harpreet from uh, Electronics Watch with us today to share their experiences of this uh, and also to tell us a bit more about uh, Electronics Watch, and what they do, and how it links to some of the specific, specific uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I had a quick look at the Sustainable Development Goals Accord this morning, uh, which is a kind of public commitment made by the universities and colleges sector to do more to deliver these goals. Uh, and other than cross-reference everything, there's a, a huge number of uh, UK institutions, both universities, uh, universities and colleges, that signed up to this accord. Um, so it really is relevant to the, to the work that we do. Um, just to say a little bit more about Electronics Watch, um, all the universities and colleges uh, in Scotland are consortium affiliates of Electronics Watch through APUC. Uh, Emma Fletcher, who heads up the development and sustainability team at APUC, is also on the Electronics Watch board. Um, EAUC were uh, an advisory member on the project to establish Electronics Watch in, in 2014, and they've been supporting that since. Um, at a more operational level, uh, APC have implemented the Electronics Watch contract clauses into our relevant frameworks to try and ensure social responsibility in our supply chains. Um, <clears throat> and we also disseminate reports that we get from uh, Electronics Watch to our members and generally try and work with them to support the work that they're doing. Um, so that's enough from me. I'll now hand over to Alfred and she'll take to her presentation. Hi, can everybody hear me okay? I hope that means yeah. yes. <laughs> Great. I'll just share my screen so that you can see my slide deck now. And while I do that, thanks very much to Samantha and everybody at EAUC and APUC for hosting me today. So my name's Harpreet. I'm the UK representative of Electronics Watch. And I'll be walking you through how Electronics Watch helps sustainable procurement and achieving some of the goals um, that you'll see in the UN SDGs that I describe. So this, this slide describes the work that Electronics Watch does to promote sustainability and human rights in the supply chain. I won't read it out, but I will conclude today's seminar by describing the ways in which it does this. Electronics Watch began with a very simple idea, that is that public procurement, which is a large market in the global economy, accountable to the public, could and should be a force for promoting sustainable development and the protection of workers' human rights in factories that make ICT goods. Electronics Watch now has more than 300 affiliates across seven countries um, with the estimated combined purchasing power of approximately 1 billion euros of the electronics market through supply contracts, purchasing orders and framework agreements. And you can see those affiliates listed um, on this slide. Electronics Watch affiliates are public sector organizations in any country. They are committed to socially responsible procurement of electronics products. Affiliates incorporate contract conditions in their ICT hardware contracts, requiring their contractors to exercise effective and accountable due diligence and ensure that final assembly and components ICT factories comply with applicable labor rights and safety standards. These contract conditions also allow Electronics Watch to monitor for compliance, and they were developed according to internationally accepted standards of due diligence, as you'll find them in the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, and to obviously also comply with EU procurement rules. Electronics Watch seeks to have impact in six key strategic areas. 
Firstly, we work to provide cutting edge tools for socially responsible public procurement and to be a platform for knowledge exchange. We enable affiliates to understand their supply chains, resulting in increased transparency. But sustainability and human rights aren't improved through transparency alone. So Electronics Watch, its affiliates and monitoring partners engage in innovative dialogue um, with industry organizations like the Responsible Business Alliance, brands and manufacturers to drive systemic industry improvements. There are a growing number of affiliates and that helps uh, strengthen public buyer leverage to demand improvements in on factory floors. And this is also assisted by worker-driven monitoring, which gives voice to those directly impacted by concerns and enables workers to contribute to solutions design. Since we started monitoring in 2015, we've seen direct improvements in the lives of more than 100,000 workers in six factories and have live um, monitoring going on in approximately 20 factories at the moment. And I'll talk about some of these um, case studies throughout the presentation. Before I return back to those case studies, let's go back to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and how they relate to Electronics Watch's work. So this slide shows some of the systemic issues that we're dealing with that prevent the achievement of some of the UN Sustainable Development Goals that I'll be talking about. And these issues are exacerbated by cyclical production with, for example, disproportionate drives in the lead up to Christmas excessive production requirements, business models that push cost and risk down the supply chain to maximize, sh maximize shareholder returns, and the absence of collective bargaining, which would empower workers in global supply chains to seek a fairer value in the chain, including a living wage. Industry brands yield profit margins of between 18 to 26%. Uh, many contract manufacturers, on the other hand, are seeing much smaller profit margins of between 1% to 4%, although Foxconn has some of the highest margins, sometimes ranging up to about 8%. But under pressure to cut prices, um, contract manufacturers squeeze labor costs, which can represent 40% of their cost. And while representing a significant proportion of the manufacturing cost, labor costs in the end, uh, represent something like 0.5% of the product end price. And that explains some of the large profit margins that you see um, when I described the, the brand profit margins. So in this market environment, the industry uses a high ratio of temporary migrant or otherwise precarious workers, and the workforce faces safety risks, exposure to hazardous chemicals, low wages, um, or wages that require an extreme amount of overtime to enable them to earn a living wage for their families. And the means for self-organization or collective bargaining are quite limited to challenge this. So the first SDG that this context relates to is SDG 1 with its goal to end poverty in all forms everywhere. Workers in the ICT supply chain continue to experience poverty and the lack of a living wage that's suitable for families is a key factor in this. And Electronics Watch continues to do work to address this. Specifically later, I'll talk about a factory in the Czech Republic where Electronics Watch has supported precarious workers to obtain a guarantee in guaranteed income. Um, but you can see that I've also included principle six of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights on this slide and the commentary to that principle refers to the importance of procurement in fulfilling this principle's goal. Um, Phil Bloomer, the executive director of Business and Human Rights Resource Center has said that business needs to demonstrate it contributes to the common good. The living wage is one of the most powerful tools for business to contribute to their workers' human rights and electronics watch terms do include provisions relating to living wage and seeking transparency around living wage um, salaries to workers in supply chains. 
The second SDG I want to talk about is goal three, which relates to health and SDG 3.9 specifically refers to reducing the number of deaths and illnesses from hazardous chemicals. In November last year, Samsung's co-president Kim Ki Nam was forced to apologize and pay approximately, well, I think it was exactly $133,000 to each victim of occupational disease or their surviving families in Seoul, South Korea. The agreement applies to anybody who worked at the Samsung, Ele Samsung Electronics plants as far back as 1984. It covers 16 types of cancer, some other rare illnesses, miscarriages, and congenital diseases suffered by workers' children. And the payment follows a 10-year campaign led by individuals um, such as Huang Sangji, whose 22-year-old daughter died of leukemia in 2007 after working at a Samsung factory in Seoul. And of course, this issue is not limited to Samsung or South Korea. There have been similar allegations of inappropriate exposure to hazardous chemicals made against Foxconn factories where Apple and other goods are produced. Complicit, um, from which you have a screenshot on this slide, is a very moving documentary film on this issue, and it highlights the incredible organizing being undertaken by, undertaken by workers such as Yi Yi Ting to improve conditions for themselves, but also their peers, and as Yi says in this documentary, to ensure that, ensure that his children and future generations aren't forced to work in hazardous conditions. And just a brief note that um, this isn't an issue that just, is relevant to Asia as far back as 1984. Um, studies, both industry and public, were making connections between miscarriages and cancers um, when looking at the instances of cancers and miscarriages in factories in the United States from Vermont to Massachusetts and California. Uh, studies found that brain and kidney cancers, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and miscarriages were more than double in semiconductor factories in comparison to the population at, at large. So in some ways, you can say the problem has been outsourced. And here are some of the significant numbers of hazardous chemicals used in the ICT supply chain. I won't talk through them, but I will say that um, Electronics Watch has undertaken work in this area, directly improving the chances of meeting SDG3. Firstly, a factory has started to report on its chemical inventory and transparency is the first step towards improving workers' situation. Secondly, workers who fainted and got sick from toxic chemicals now work in a safer environment in Indonesia. The chemical concerned here was a cleaning solvent used to clean electronics components, and the toxicological effects were shown to affect the central nervous system, eye, skin, respiratory system, liver, and kidneys, and the danger to young women of childbearing age was especially acute. And resulting in birth defects and miscarriages. In this case, following Electronics Watch engagement, the factory concerned replaced the toxic solvent with a le less toxic alternative and improved engineering controls. So SDG 8 is perhaps the goal that most directly and instinctively link to the work that Electronics Watch does. It refers to the need to promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. And Electronics Watch has achieved a significant amount in this area. SDG 8.5 specifically refers to the need to protect particularly vulnerable workers, highlighted in bold. And as the case studies involving exposure to hazardous chemicals show already, many of the issues we come across do disproportionately impact women, particularly childbearing women who make up a number of workers in the ICT supply chain. But another vulnerable group um, that we've looked at is young people. 
one of the first issues that Electronics Watch started monitoring following concerns received under the UK um, Higher Education Framework Agreement was that of involuntary student labour. Chinese education policy requires that uh, secondary vocational institutions provide student internships. These internships should be related to the field of a student study, but in reality, it was uncovered that a high number of student interns were being forced to work in ICT factories, particularly in server factories, and unable to choose when and where they interned. Receipt of their educational diplomas was contingent on the com completion of the internship and many, including Xu Min, who was an accountancy undergraduate, ended up working 10 to 12 hours a day, six days a week, including long night shifts with minimal breaks. According to the ILO definition, this is a form of forced labour. So since the issue first came to light in 2015, Electronics Watch has engaged in on-site worker surveys, worker management dialogue training, dialogue with brands and the factory concerned, and affiliate engagement. And improvements had been made in 2017 when um, factories started implementing stricter student intern policies. Electronics Watch affiliates directly contributed to this outcome with UK Higher Education Purchasing Consortia that purchased servers, servers put Electronics Watch supplier engagement recommendations into effect. They contacted their account management representatives at each supplier raising concerns. Um, at the end of last year, in October 2018, the Hong Kong-based NGO Students and Scholars Against Corporate Misbehaviour, or SACOM, indicated that the issues are beginning to persist again, and Electronics Watch will continue to monitor the situation and seek confirmation that the previously agreed to policies are being adhered to in practice. SDG 8.8 .8 concerns the need to protect labour rights and promote safe and secure working environments for all, including migrant workers, in particular women migrants and those in precarious employment. And I'm going to discuss the ways in which Electronics March has this in relation to two case studies, one concerning Burmese migrant workers in Thailand and the other concerning Czech workers. So with um, Thailand first, migrant workers from Myanmar alerted the Burmese Migrant Workers' Rights Network of a Thai factory retaining their passports and other identity documents. MWRN conducted interviews with a number of migrant workers from Myanmar regarding document retention and other recruitment practices at the factory. Workers interviewed had been employed for between two months and a year. None of them were in possession of their original identity documents, and these documents, passports, work permits, etc., were being held by recruitment agencies or subcontractors. MWRN is an Electronics Watch monitoring partner. They also identified that many migrant workers had paid money to get their jobs and so had incurred debts of between 150 and 700 US dollars to recruitment agencies and the workers' wage slips were also showing deductions for food and housing. When workers are deprived of their own passports and personal identity documents and charged high recruitment fees, their freedom of movement is curtailed. And again, according to the ILO conventions, there is a risk of forced labor and debt bondage. The Electronics Watch Code, um, the relevant brand in this case, is own supply chain on foreign migrant workers standards and Thai labor law all had provisions trying to prevent this 
type of thing from happening. Thai labour law, for example, didn't permit wage deductions for housing and food. The brand supply chain for migrant workers standard prohibited recruitment agencies and factories and other third parties from holding identity documents, etc. Um, but this didn't stop the issue in practice. And again, Electronic Swatch has undertaken a significant amount of engagement on this issue, as shown on this slide. And this has resulted in improvements. We have had um, the immediate return of all the identity and personal documents to workers. Workers have been moved from temporary to permanent work placements and have been provided compensation for debt. But we do continue to seek confirmation that workers' debts don't arise from excessive or leg illegitimate fees, such as recruitment fees that the review of recruitment policies and the costs of recruitment agents to ensure legal compliance takes place, that the brand's own supply chain standard is adhered to and that the brand standard is um, provided to workers in Thai, Cambodian and Myanmar um, language, languages. And we've also asked for the brand to work with the factory to invite MWRN to conduct training with workers and managers on proper recruitment practices. This type of training is a unique um, factor that Electronics Watch brings to sustainability as this type of training is what ultimately ensures improvements can be sustained by organizations and workers on the ground. Workers' rights education is an important form of risk mitigation. Um, it helps to ensure workers know when there are risks to their rights being impacted and that they can raise concerns to local organizations or elect electronics watch when this happens, which can prevent the risk of um, forced labor and debt bondage continuing. The second case that I said that I would talk about was the Czech Republic case. In 2016, Electronics Watch found risk of breach of labor standards in a factory in the Czech Republic. And there were particular concerns regarding indirectly employed precarious workers, many of whom were again migrant workers, although this time from other parts of Eastern Europe. And the key issues centered around a differential pay um, and treatment between core and agency workers, highly precarious uh, work contracts, freedom of association limitations, wage deductions for agency workers, overcrowding in transportation and housing with um, something like four workers per dormitory, limited numbers of showers, no separate showers for women and men, limited kitchen facilities, etc. Electronics Watch again worked with the brand and the factory to mitigate the risk of labor rights breaches, remedy evident breaches, compensate affected workers, support agency workers to obtain an equal wage on same conditions as core workers, and work to ensure that the brand concerned does not pay prices or demand delivery schedules that would make it unfeasible for goods to be produced according, in accordance with its own supplier code and the Czech Republic's labor code. So work to ensure the agreement between Foxconn and the agency did not result in those breaches. And there have been improvements so far. There has been a move away from 12 hour shifts to eight hour shifts. And there are now improvements so that the same issues with short notice for um, shifts isn't coming up and weekend work isn't coming up. Previously we were seeing workers being told in the early hours of the morning, 3, 4, 5 a.m., that they might have a shift at 8 a.m. or on other days uh, going to the factory at 8 a.m. and finding that they didn't have a shift. And so those types of things are being addressed. And workers now also have a guaranteed minimum wage irrespective of the number of hours that they're working. SDG 8 also speaks um, 
about modern slavery, 8.7 specifically, and many ICT supply chain workers are at risk of modern slavery, which includes forced labour. And I've talked about this already in relation to student internal labour in China, recruitment fees and document confiscation and debt bondage in Thailand. According to the ILO, about 21 million men, women and children around the world work in conditions of slavery and forced labour. Some NGOs put the number at double this. But it's estimated that um, those in, in conditions of modern slavery uh, raise something like $150 billion in illegal profits every year. And the risk factors for forced labor are prevalent in the electronics watch. These include inadequate laws and regulations, weak enforcement of those um, where they are in place, high levels of poverty, and growing use of third-party labor recruitment agencies, sometimes responsible for hiring, managing, and disciplining workers, all increase vulnerable vulnerability of workers to forced labor. And they also erode worker protections and employer accountability inherent in the employer-employee relationship. Um, in addition to the UN SDGs, the Modern Slavery Act uh, 2015 in the UK, which you'll all know about, requires commercial and public interest organisations with an annual turnover of £36 million pounds or more to publish an anti-slavery statement setting out the steps that the organisation has taken to ensure that slavery, forced labour and human trafficking are not taking part in its supply chains or businesses. The Home Office's guidance um, on the transparency provisions of the Modern Slavery Act suggests that institutions take measures to enable five key outcomes, transparency, due diligence, monitoring and evaluation, remedy and training. And I'll talk about how Electronics Watch affiliation helps to meet these outcomes in turn. So transparency, supply chain transparency consists of four parts, identification of factories and goods associated with final assembly and components, disclosure of chemical inventory records for each factory, disclosure of factory compliance findings and corrective action plans, and assessment of trading conditions such as pricing and delivery terms that may impact working conditions in factories. So these are terms that you will find in Electronics Watch terms and conditions. And Electronics Watch has had success in improving transparency with a number of brands now linking um, at least some of their factories to the subject matter of the contracts of public buyers. Due diligence, Electronics Watch affiliates that incorporate its model uh, contract terms into its agreements with ICT suppliers are suppliers to ensure that goods in their supply chain are produced in compliance with a specific labor code. And this code includes reference to both domestic and international labor standards, including core ILO conventions, a number of other ILO conventions and recommendations, Article 23 of the, Unif uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which cites the right to just and favorable conditions of work, and Article 32 of the CRC on child rights, which recognizes the right of children to be protected from economic uh, exploitation. Electronics Watch um, affiliates again have um, terms and conditions that enable Electronics Watch to undertake monitoring activities and to respond um, to disclosures of factories, but also require submissions of compliance plans, access of a network of monitors to inspect factories, and to ensure responsiveness to Electronics Watch and affiliate engagement. In addition, the Home Office guidance refers to the need to hear from workers themselves when undertaking monitoring activities, both through trade unions and other representatives, 
as well as through enabling whistleblowers to come forward and protecting them when they do. Electronics Watch affiliates have access to an extensive network of monitoring organisations that conduct worker-driven monitoring with the goal of strengthening workers' own voices to report on and address human rights and labour rights violations. Electronics Watch monitors are set up to receive in-person worker complaints, hotline reports and other worker testimonies and this has been helpful in ensuring that we have up-to-date and relevant information about issues in the supply chain. And this year we'll be looking to strengthen our mon monitoring methodology in five countries. So again, um, if a contractor fails to take necessary steps to exercise its leverage to achieve compliance in accordance with the Electronics Watch Code um, or to respond to the request for information under the terms and conditions, Electronics Watch can engage with the contract informally to try and bring about compliance. And if that doesn't work, we would recommend formal escalation procedures, and these are provided for in the contract conditions. Electronics Watch can continue to engage with the contractor at this stage on behalf of one or several affiliates. And we would hope to resolve most issues informally or through escalation procedures if a brand or supplier hasn't provided the information requested in the terms and conditions um, but if the contractor refuses to engage affiliates can decide to apply contractual sanctions the final element um, in the home office's guidance for compliance with the modern slavery act relates to training of which more, uh, electronics watch uh, provides for its affiliates, but it's also making available a supply chain database and company performance trackers and tools, um, which will also assist in this. So SDG 12 looks at the management of natural resources and Electronics Watch has grant funding at the moment through EU DARE, Make ICT Fair uh, funding, which will look to extend the requirements that I've talked about, um, which currently apply at the final assembly and components level down to the mining level. SDG um, 12 also talks about integrating sustainability information into their reporting cycle and promoting public procurement practices uh, that are sustainable. So public procurement as a force for sustainable development and human rights protection is now universally accepted. It appears, as you can see, in the UN SDGs in the UN Guiding Principle on Business and Human Rights, uh, number six, and, direct, and the Procurement Directive, EU Procurement Directive, also allows contracting authorities to introduce social considerations throughout the procurement stages and demand compliance with international labor standards during contract performance. And I'll conclude by outlining the ways in which Electronics Watch seeks to enable universities and other public authorities to promote UN SDGs through, um, and human rights through procurement. So affiliates enable the promotion of the UN SDGs and protection of human rights in three ways. They demand decent working conditions in their contracts. I've talked about the code of conduct that suppliers must adhere to and the transparency obligations. And Electronics Watch has clear processes to help suppliers meet their obligations. They monitor for compliance through Electronics Watch. We have extensive network of monitors, but also provide tools for experts, both in procurement and sustainability departments of affiliates to assist with contract management and we help affiliates work collaboratively to make improvements the case studies reveal the impact of what's possible direct change in people's lives when uh, affiliates act together and electronics watch establishes a platform for public organizations that want to collaborate beyond organizational and national boundaries 
electronics watch contract conditions are implemented in the co contract performance phase and this allows a sustainable and long-term engagement with contractors and industry. A number of contracts contain the Electronics Watch contract clauses. Electronics Watch does occasionally update the contract conditions and a second generation contract conditions are available. And of course, they're consistent with the EU procurement directive um, and contract law and the public contracts regulation 2015. And following the MIC ICT Fair EU grant, the contract conditions may be further updated to include responsibilities further down the supply chain at some point in the future. And this pictured report is an example of how Electronics Watch is engaging with companies. Such reports are important communication tools for electronics watch towards companies. The categories and symbols um, ensure that companies know which issues to respond to and prioritize appropriately and electronics watch reports to affiliates and also through transparency guidelines to the public on the monitoring processes and its results. So the urgent core and recurrent designations, as I say, help affiliates get detailed information on violations in their supply chain and also helps contractors and suppliers take action. So what you get from Electronics Watch are monitoring reports, a public buyer toolkit, a voice in Electronics Watch. Electronics Watch and its affiliates have as I say, contributed to improvements in six factories employing more than 100,000 workers, ending forced labor in a factory in China, addressing debt bondage in Thailand, and returning identity and work documents to workers, reinstating some workers that were illegally fired for union organizing in a factory in the Philippines, which is a case study I didn't talk about improving work shift scheduling and increasing pay for agency workers in the Czech Republic so that temporary workers with no previously no job security now receive a guaranteed income, improving occupational health and safety. In another case study that I didn't mention um, in the Philippines, we were able to work to double the severance package of workers. And we've also been able to obtain compensation of the family of a worker that committed suicide. Electronics Watch currently has uh, ongoing engagement with dozens of brands and investigations engagement, as I say, in over 20 factories addressing factory specific issues, but also systemic industry issues. Um, and the image on this slide needs updating, but it gives you a sense of the tangible improvements that Electronics Watch is able to make in people's lives. Thank you for listening. Um, before I ask if anyone has questions, I just wanted to note my contact information on the slide. And although the date of the event this year hasn't been confirmed in early December every year, Electronics Watch hosts an annual conference which brings together leading practitioners um, in the field of socially responsible public procurement, experts in international labour rights, but also grassroots workplace monitors from the electronics producing regions around the world. And it provides sustainability and procurement officials with the unique opportunity to meet the monitors and workers in their supply chain and crowdsource solutions. And last year's conference did that with lots of post-it notes and collaborative um, thinking. So it would be great to have more people at that conference. Uh, the 2019 conference took place in Amsterdam. The conferences before that took place in London. But once the date and venue have been confirmed for this year, I'll pass them to Samantha and hopefully we'll see some of you there. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you very much, Harpreet. That was absolutely fascinating and lots to go away and think about. Um, we're going to open up for um, some questions just now. 
Uh, I think Kate Murray from Edinburgh Native University is going to chair this session. She's our further convener for our sustainable procurement topic support network. Great, thanks, Anne. Um, so we're just opening the floor up to questions from anybody about anything from um, Mohar Kate's presentation or any of the work of Alex Lynch's watch. Um, please indicate to us. So you can add a message in the chat box um, or if you want to unmute yourself, or Sam can unmute you and um, ask your question. Hi, it's Olivia from King's College. Hi, I've just unmuted myself. Sorry, I couldn't raise my hand. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, can hear you. Yeah, great. Just a quick question. Um, I saw on the slide um, that the LUPC, the London Purchasing Consortium, is an affiliate member of Electronics Watch. So, so does that mean that if we purchase through them, they are we're doing we sort of all all bases are covered, or is there more that we should be doing um, with our suppliers, or have we ticked that box because we're going through them and they're an affiliate? I suppose is my question. Sure. Um, so LUPC and, as Stephen mentioned, APUC have affiliated on behalf of all their members, and that's um, a different affiliation um, structure to Southern University's Purchasing Consortium, which has not affiliated on behalf of all its members. Um, and while LUPC have done the work of incorporating the electronics watch contract terms into framework agreements, we do find that some additional engagement um, of universities to ask for information that's requested in those contract terms is helpful. I wonder, Stephen, if you wanted to add anything about this from APUC's perspective. Uh, yeah, happy to do that. Yeah, um, so I think you're right. I mean, in terms of the, we said that the frameworks that are kind of operated by LUPC obviously have the kind of contract terms and stuff in them. So it, you know, as you say, that's kind of a, a box ticked, if you like. But kind of beyond that, I think there is definitely a role for institutions to to kind of follow up in terms of kind of contract management. Um, I think to be always kind of um, asking the questions. I think there's a lot around um, around. And I think Harvey, you mentioned in your presentation about the sort of the, the monitoring and the really the monitoring is kind of hugely important in terms of kind of continually keeping the pressure on um, on, uh, on the brands to kind of uh, you know to, to make sure that this stuff is being followed through uh, and to show that there is real interest you know from from, from the sector thanks that's that's helpful thank you mm -hmm. Okay, so we have another couple of questions that have come in through the chat. Um, so the first question is, what level of engagement has been undertaken with resellers of brands? Um, and another comment and question to say, thanks for the presentation, Harpreet. Interesting and worrying case studies. Does Electronics Watch achieve most action via highlighting labour laws? Or does customer pressure also play a part? Great. So we have undertaken a significant amount of um, collaboration and engagement with resellers and brands and, as I say, factory manufacturers too. So there are, I guess, different levels of engagement and sometimes that engagement happens through an industry body like the RBA. But um, we've had a uh, positive amount of engagement from some brands as I say that have improved transparency and have started to link the subject matter of contracts and provide factory specific information um, and we've also seen the positive outcomes um, that took place as I said in the Foxconn case which is um, a manufacturer through the brand in that case also being engaged um, the key obligations for uh, suppliers is that they achieve outcomes within their control. So 
those are outcomes that they can first achieve without intervention by another um, actor. But if uh, a contractor isn't able to achieve a specified outcome and it's not within the contractor's control because it is in the control of um, a brand or a factory, then the contractor is asked to comply with its contractual obligations by exercising and demonstrating what we refer to as effective due diligence. So we aren't um, looking for a guarantee for resellers or brands to provide a guarantee of compliance, but we are expecting companies to exercise due diligence to achieve human rights compliance. And the second question, can you remind me? So the second question is, does Electronics Watch achieve most action via highlighting labour laws or does customer pressure also play a part, a major part? Yeah, I think that um, certainly a combination of the two is relevant. Um, with the student intern case in um, China, what was found was that long-term engagement with the brand and the factory concerned on its obligations under international labor standards was helpful to a certain extent but over time as issues kept repeating the um, public authorities that had linked the goods to their supply chain felt that they needed to escalate matters and in that case um, which also concerned the Swedish county councils there was um, a step taken to escalate matters and to, to after years of engagement to make the concerns public and that helped um, put public pressure on the organization which also saw benefits but certainly we have seen um, improvements being made without that type of public facing consumer driven campaign almost needing to take place. The other case studies that I mentioned all took place with um, supplier engagement, brand engagement, um, engagement with the RBA uh, and, and didn't require the same level of um, a, a public facing campaign. Okay, thanks for that. And we have another question in the chat box, but I'd like to invite, um, would anyone like to raise a question by unmuting themselves first? Um, if not, I'll, I'll go ahead with the question that we have here. Hi, this is Tracy Ann uh, from the University of Stirling. I just Thanks very much for your information. Um, presentation was um, very good and, and quite uh, concerning and interesting. Um, but just to ask uh, where we can find all of these great tools you were talking about, your escalation procedures and your contract conditions, um, the training available and the supply chain database. Thank you. Sure, I'll just um, try and share my screen again and link you to the um, Electronics Watch website, um, where if you're an affiliate, as you will be through your affiliation with APUC, you would have access to the affiliates login part of the website. And in that website, you can see a number of um, resources. And for public buyers, in the segment that says for public buyer for buyers, you'll see a public buyer toolkit. And as I say, with your affiliate login, you would have access to a number of resources within that section. The database is in the process of being developed and should be available um, imminently and I can uh, speak to Bjorn and Peter at Electronics Watch and, and, and provide an update to APUC if, if you're interested in knowing more about that. Thank you very much, that was, um, yeah, that'd be great. 
Okay, that's great. Um, that was, I think, Tracy, that was your question in the chat box as well, wasn't it? So um, that's being covered now. Are there any other questions uh, for Harpreet about um, anything to do with her work at Electronics Watch? Hi, sorry, just another question. As um, I mean, just generally, what kind of support do does Electronic Watch get through the country's own governments? For instance, China and Thailand. If this is all international, you know, law and things, and you know, just you know, in, in the countries that you work for, where where does the government kind of sit in on that? Sure. So the engagement that we have. Um, try to do is with the workers themselves, the monitoring organizations that workers have access to, uh, the factories, the brands, um, resellers, but we have also attempted to engage with country representatives and they might be representatives on uh, sustainable development or um, have a particular role on labor standards domestically so that is something that we have um, engaged with to differing success in different countries um, my understanding is that while electronics watch weren't engaged with the samsung case that i mentioned at the outset in south korea that um, domestic engagement in that um, case was very helpful and so i think it's something that we will also continue to do um, but of course a lot of these countries are uh, operating in a in, in a kind of market where they're seeking uh, seeking Foxconn and other manufacturers to open up factories there and so deregulation um, and potentially turning a blind eye are, are issues that we come across where there are labor standards in, in place but they aren't being enforced or where there are, there's just no suitable labor regulation so while it's a difficult um, context it is something that we think is worth continuing to pursue and, and do pursue. Okay, great. We've got another question that's just come in through the chat, um, which is, does Electronic Swatch do any work to increase awareness at student and staff level regarding labour condition? I'm unsure what the level of awareness is. Just thinking of the impact of various programs on plastics and the fashion industry of late. Yeah, I think that the um, recent awareness around those things is hugely helpful. Um, the in the past, Electronics Watch has co-screened a showing of Complicit with LUPC, and I think that has been hugely helpful, actually, in bringing individuals' stories to light, because I can talk about international labor standards, and um, it, it doesn't have the same impact as hearing from a father say, you know, I don't want my children working in these conditions um, after having contracted occupational leukemia and that type of impact I think comes through a showing of a very moving documentary like Complicit so I think that's something that Electronics Watch would be interested in doing again if there are other purchasing consortia or universities <laughs> that want to do that locally um, uh, and at the student level Electronics Watch was um, co-founded through a make ICT Fair grant from 2012 to 2015, of which some um, campaigning and lobbying organizations were a part of. And so historically, there has been that work that's been undertaken by those NGOs who continue to be partners through um, collaborative bids. So, for example, um, Catapa and Setem uh, in Germany and Spain and People and Planet in the UK have been student organisations that are partners in that Make ICT Fair uh, EU grant that, that do awareness raising from the mining level um, up to final assembly uh, level.
Okay, thanks very much, Harpreet. Um, I think we're just coming up to 11 o'clock now, so I think um, we've covered a lot of questions. Um, and just to remind everyone, we're going to share the, the slides. The session has been recorded, so that will be circulated um, to everybody. It will go up on the Sustainability Exchange uh, website. Um, and just a couple of things we sort of mentioned, if anyone's kind of listened to this presentation, Harpreet, and wants to kind of know more about, keep up to date basically with the work of Electronics Watch, um, obviously where would you direct them to in terms of if you want to sign up to the newsletter, if they want to make sure they're logged in as an affiliate, um, could you explain how, how people can do that? Yep, sure. So it would be great if uh, you did sign up to a newsletter which is at electronicswatch.org if you're able to log in as affiliates and make use of the tools and contact me if you have any comments or queries about how to use them I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have um, and also Electronics Watch may uh, organize webinars throughout the year on specific issues that arise so Again, I can pass on that information to Samantha to, to send around. But it would be wonderful to see you in, in December. As I, as I say, the um, conference in December is a really unique opportunity to come face to face with workers in your supply chain and talk about how contract management might help improve uh, their conditions. So there are there's some of the ways that I'd encourage you to get involved and you can also follow us on Twitter at ElectroWatch. That's great, thanks very much Harpreet. Um, and just to also mention for um, APUC um, members, we share information through the weekly e-zine as well, so the highlights are mentioned and um, kind of linked into there, so you should also um, receive the information even if you're not signed up for the newsletter. Um, Great, that's been really interesting. Thank you, Harper. I'll pass back over to Sam to kind of wrap up and, um, yeah. Great, Sam, thanks. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, just uh, thank you so much for Stephen, Kate and Harper as well. Uh, that was absolutely fascinating. And it's also gonna be a great resource um, that we can share as well widely. So please do send that to your colleagues if they weren't able to attend today, um, along with the presentation as well. Um, just to say we'll send the survey out where we love doing events like this and sharing the learning, especially with some people we don't 